Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bill Trainer. I'm the Dean of Georgetown Law. And I'm delighted to welcome you to Georgetown Law for this timely and important discussion. We're pleased to be joined today by our colleagues from Georgetown University's Racial Justice Institute and the Berkeley Center uh, for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. And we're especially honored uh, to have HUD Deputy Secretary Adrian Todman uh, with us to deliver remarks and engage in a conversation about justice and housing. So round of applause for our guests. The Biden administration has pledged to pursue a comprehensive plan to end homelessness, and the administration has made affordable housing a top priority. They propose measures to ease rental prices, outline a renter's bill of rights, and improve financing opportunities for home construction and purchases. Underlying these policies is the commitment to a fundamental principle that housing is a human right, an essential element for a life of security and dignity. As lawyers, we have a special responsibility to use our skills to enforce rights and to work towards a more just society. And we feel that particularly powerfully at Georgetown Law, where our motto is laws, but the means justice is the end. We're pleased to have this opportunity to host Secretary Todman who's devoted so much of her distinguished career to making the right to housing a reality. And now I'd like to welcome Professor Massimino, our Executive Director of Georgetown Law's Human Rights Institute, to the podium to introduce the Secretary. Great. Thank you so much, Bill, and, and welcome, everybody. We are glad to have you with us today for this important discussion about housing and human rights. People often think about human rights as something to do with the struggle for freedom and dignity in other countries, but that misses the essential wisdom and power of the human rights idea, that respect for the inherent dignity of every individual and protection of their human rights begins, as Eleanor Roosevelt said once, in small places close to home. A chief architect of the Universal Declaration of human rights, Roosevelt put it this way, where after all do universal human rights begin? In small places close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world, yet they are the world to the individual person, the neighborhood they live in, the school they attend, the factory or farm or office where they work. These are the places, she said, where every man, woman, and child seeks justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, she said, they have little meaning anywhere. And without concern, concerted citizen action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. So we are incredibly fortunate today to have someone with us who has spent her entire career working for justice and dignity close to home. Adrian Todman has dedicated her career to improving people's lives, strengthening neighborhoods through housing and strong community development. As the CEO of the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials, Secretary Todman advocated for funding and policies to preserve and develop affordable housing and help communities thrive. As the Executive Director of the District of Columbia Housing Authority, she pioneered an award-winning model to house veterans experiencing homelessness, increased home ownership opportunities by 50% for low and moderate income families, increased the number of affordable housing units available in neighborhoods experiencing rapid growth, and commissioned the first citywide needs assessment of public housing residents. At HUD, she was the manager of a $500 million grant competition that focused on the redevelopment of distressed public housing sites and then as a policy aide at HUD in both the Office of Public and Indian Housing and the Office of the Secretary, where she worked with staff across HUD's programs on policy solutions and streamlining program implementation. She began her career in public service on the Hill, just over here in the office of then Congressman Ron, Ron DeLugo, 
a long serving delegate representing the US Virgin Islands where Secretary Todman was born and raised. Today, she works alongside Secretary Marsha Fudge to ensure that HUD has the staff and the tools that it needs to administer and provide oversight over programs critical to supporting people and communities across the country. We're very excited to have a true champion of housing rights with us today. Please join me in welcoming the 12th Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Honorable Adrian Todd. Well, thank you for that. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be here. I see some wonderful former uh, colleagues and friends uh, here in the audience. I'm happy you were able to take the time and just all of you taking the time today. I'd like to thank the Berkeley Center and Michael and Elissa for the work that you have done to, uh, in general, but also to partner with HUD. So we're able to address this very august group of students and others this afternoon. You know, um, you mentioned uh, the fact that I'm from St. Thomas, and so I will, I'll kind of start there. Um, my first trip to Washington, D.C. was when I was a, a junior in high school, and I attended the St. Peter and Paul High School in St. Thomas, and this was one of those aha moments in my career, because I recognize when I was here for a week long uh, uh, sort of civics um, experience where we went to all the branches of government, Supreme Court, we did the executive branch, went to, to Congress. I realized then um, the power of one person or a few people to really impact the lives of hundreds and thousands and millions of people across the world and across the globe, just experiencing sort of the energy and what people had an opportunity to do here. So I beelined back here to Washington after I graduated from, from college. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons I was able to, to leave St. Thomas and go to a small liberal, women's liberal arts school in Northampton, Massachusetts, was because I came from a home where I felt safe and loved. Um, and it was inf and infused with enough confidence to know that I could go anywhere in this country and perhaps the globe and lead a thriving life. Uh, but that journey didn't start with me. It started with my grandmother who didn't have an opportunity for a formal education, but worked hard to make sure that her, her daughter did. And my mother, who didn't have an opportunity to attend college, but made sure that her baby girl, that's me, um, was able to achieve that. And the work that I do now is centered on, imagine, I'm imagining a moment where my, neither my grandmother nor my mother had the stability of a home with which to make sure that generations that came after them would be able to thrive. And that centers so much of how I think about the work we do in our built environment. It's, it's not just about the four walls and the roof and the plumbing. And it's not just about making sure the community amenities are good. It's about all the people that need to have rich community focused communities, but also homes that they're able to thrive. You know, one of the reasons I'm so pleased to serve in the Biden administration is that I'm not the only person that believes this. Um, any one of my colleagues from Treasury, from HHS, from education, from agriculture could be standing right here now and express the same sentiment as relates to their body of work. But I'm here to talk about HUD, and I'm happy to do so. So I know that all of you are probably well aware of some of the main things that HUD does. You know, we, we fund operating funds for public housing. Um, we make sure that the Section 8 program is available to serve individuals with rent assistance so that they're able to pay their rent on the private rental market. 
And through those programs, we help about 5 million people across the country. But what you probably don't know is some of the other things that HUD does in the space of housing justice. We fund the removal of lead and other hazards in private homes and public homes, but I wanna emphasize private homes across the country. It's a piece of work that the secretary is particularly, particularly um, that she focuses on. We support first time homeowners in, in several ways. Maybe some of you all one day when you're able to purchase a home. We, we have housing counselors across the country that literally teach people how to be a homeowner and how to access the different tools that are available. We help with, us, we help with down payment assistance, which I know tends to be a barrier for first time homeowners. We provide a very powerful tool through our Federal Housing Administration to mortgage insurance. And let me, let me linger there for a little bit. Just last year, 84% of the mortgages that HUD insured were first-time homeowners. And when you look at the entire market of, in, of entities that do mortgage insurance, we by far exceed the ability to make sure that black and brown people are able to purchase a home. And what does that mean? That means that they're the first, perhaps in their family, to be able to grow generational wealth and to be able to pass that on to their children. We support the construction and of new healthcare facilities. I bet you didn't know that. Um, we, we help insure those mortgages and in places across the country, rural areas particularly where, but for the support that we provide, there might not be healthcare facilities available. We fund and partner with states and localities after a disaster to make sure that communities are built back in a resilient and equitable way. Just last year, we provided over $5 billion to 16 states and 10 cities across the country. And these are sadly places that we've seen on TV, the wildfires in California, tornadoes in Kentucky, hurricanes in Louisiana and points north. Um, HUD does this work and we center it very clearly around making sure that those individuals who tend to be black and brown, who are black and brown, who are most impacted after a disaster, thinking about people who rent, people who are low income, who don't have the resiliency or the resources to be able to just bounce back. We make sure that these disaster recovery funds are used to make sure that those communities and those individuals are either able to come home, but also if they are there, they can build back their homes in a resilient way too, unfortunately, try to withstand what inevitably may be the next storm. We build housing. I know that seems like something that we should do given that housing's in our, in our name, but we build housing. And one of the reasons that we have an affordability crisis here in this country is that we have not been building housing at the pace that we need for, dare say, the last 15 years or so. And so back last May, the administration created a housing supply action plan. And I emphasize the word action because we, we said, is this a task force, another Washington DC task force? Is this a, a, you know, a plan for the future? And we decided, no, this is, a, this is an action plan. We are, we are going to do things. We are going to push money out the door and try to make sure we're braiding all of our programs together to ensure that we are increasing the supply of not just housing, but affordable housing. So HUD works with our colleagues again at Agriculture and Veterans Administration and Treasury to make sure that our programs are harmonizing and we are building housing that people need. Um, one of the things that we did last year I wanna to bring to your attention is as we're building housing, we're trying to be more creative. We know that we have been building with, with sticks and bricks now for, for some time. And I don't know if any of you had an opportunity to come to our Innovative Housing Showcase on the mall, and if you didn't, you, you missed a lot. And, and this is the next generation, the next gen of how we need to build things. I'm talking about modular housing. I'm talking about accessory, accessory dwelling units or ADUs, um, 3D printed homes. I've been inside a 3D printed home. It's cool. It's interesting how they make that work, but it's, it's cool. But these are all things that as a country, um, as a brilliant country, we have to find new ways to really deal with the housing supply matter. And so you're in luck if you missed it last year, we have another showcase 
um, this coming June that I really encourage all of you to go to the National Mall and really learn with us as we're trying to make sure that folks understand that manufactured housing today is not necessarily the manufactured housing um, of our grandparents. It's amazing what's being built and what's available. We released our first ever climate action plan, and I certainly don't have to share with, with this group the importance of taking on um, the challenge that climate change has presented. You know, HUD has a number of initiatives to make sure that our programs are collect collectively across the country reducing our carbon footprint. We're working very closely, um, and you will hear this a lot about how much we're working with our other agencies. Um, it, it is a real thing. We, we partner so often because we want to make sure we're bringing the full force of the federal government to these issues, but we're working very closely with our partners at EPA, our partners at Energy, our partners at Treasury. Um, they got billions of dollars in the Inflation Reduction Act. I encourage you all to, to really avail yourselves of some of the information there, particularly the Treasury Department, which is going to be providing tax rebates and tax credits for little things to make sure that each one of us are participating in the climate change movement. But we work with all of these agencies to ensure that those funds are not just going to the folks who are able to access them because they have the information that they're able to go to folks who you know, are working hard, maybe two or three jobs, maybe inside of the gig economy, and don't have access to information to understand, oh, I can have solar panels placed on, on my home and reduce my utility costs. Oh, I am able to, provide, to, to purchase, you know, things are, will in, in, in improve you know, the, the use of energy inside of my homes and, and other, and other parts of, of the appliances. And, and it's through those very discreet, real-time abilities to say to the American people, here is what we can do to help, is where I believe this administration is excelling. Of course, we enforce the fair housing law. Um, you know, there was a little bit of a kerfuffle during the last administration as it relates to the fair housing law. I think what they did in my own words was they took the fair out of housing um, and forgot what the point of the fair housing law is. One of the things that we've done and the secretary's done and the president's done is to reintroduce the point of that law, which is that we have an obligation to make sure that discriminatory practices are eliminated in this country. We have an obligation to make sure that bad actors are brought to justice. One of the things that we're doing inside of that space, and this is gonna sound very bureaucrat y but we are affirmatively furthering fair housing. And that is a portion of the fair housing law that has never actually been actualized. We've never really stood it up. And so what is that? So the fair housing law is, is typically looked at as someone has discriminated against me and I'm gonna file a complaint and hold that person responsible. But there's a whole other portion of the law that's much more aspirational. That's much more, what can we do to prevent segregation? What can we do to make sure that if you are disabled, you are able to find some place to, to live? What can we do to make sure that our seniors are aging gracefully? What that piece of the law does is make sure that the entire protected classes have access to opportunities that's been taken away from them for so very long. And we're very proud of that work. In fact, we have a, a, a notice um, that will be published on Friday in the Federal Register. We encourage all of you who care about these issues to just let us know what your thoughts are about ways that we can really do better as a country. One other piece that we've done um, inside of the space of housing justice to really bring those words to life is around the space of appraisal bias. If you live in a black neighborhood, your home is very likely appraised at 20% less than if you live in a white neighborhood. And this is not surprising, I'm sure, to any of you who, who have lived in the DMV or probably other parts of the country. But one of the things that the president told Susan Rice, who is the director of the Domestic Policy Council and Secretary Fudge, that we have to correct this, we have to change this. And so we did put together a task force, but this was an action-oriented task force. And 
produced a report last year that laid out, laid out very carefully how we got to this point and also laid out the things we need to do to move forward. I encourage this group to watch that work because when I think about how many decades and how many generations of families who have lost earnings, lost some of the wealth that was theirs to receive from generation to generation, it is criminal and certainly not representative of what this administration wants by way of housing justice. I will share that one of the things that I am particularly proud of that we've done happened way before uh, uh, I even uh, began to work at the department. And that is what we did to ensure that renters and homeowners were able to stay in their homes because of the economic impact of the pandemic. We, many of us, have the luxury right now of not reading the headlines about all of the renters who would potentially lose their jobs. I'm thinking about the service workers, you know, people who worked in restaurants, uh, people who were perhaps janitorial workers in office buildings like this who weren't able to work. All of the folks who, because we stayed home or the country shut down, they were not able to work and lost their jobs. There are millions and millions of individuals who could have been evicted, who may have lost their home. They may have been for, their home may have been foreclosed, but for the actions of this administration. And people will say, well, we don't hear about it in the news. You know why? Because it didn't happen. The Department of Treasury was able to use $46 billion and send out $8 million of rental payments to pay the back rent for Americans. They were also able, and at HUD, we were able to, to say to homeowners who are facing economic harm, like, you know what, we can pause. We'll, we'll put your debt into forbearance right now while you kind of stabilize yourself. But then we went one step extra. We said, we will be able to, to restructure your mortgage debt so it can keep up with wherever you are right now. And we saved 1 million homeowners from losing their homes with those actions. I'm very proud of that work. And I think that it, it, it is an extraordinary example of making sure that notwithstanding the fact that this pandemic was something we couldn't control as a public health matter, that we were able as a federal government to really impact people who were hurting the most. And I think that's something we should all be proud of because it's your taxpayer dollars that put that in place. You know, homelessness is something where we, we can look around us, particularly here in Washington, D.C., and just up a block or two. And we see many of our homeless neighbors who are some in harm's way, some who are just looking for a little bit of help so they can navigate to their next apartment. This administration has made a decision that we are going to end homelessness as best we can with all the resources that we have available to us. We just produced a interagency homeless action plan not too long ago with our colleagues, um, again, that, that federal government partnership. And, you know, we've what we've done is looked very creatively with the resources we have available. Just last week, the secretary was in Chicago and distributed what's called unsheltered funds. And what is that? We, we fund a lot of work in the homelessness space, including um, access to vouchers, but we've never had an opportunity until now to really center our work on just the unsheltered. Many of the people that we all see, particularly here in DC, who are in tents and sitting and standing um, throughout the city. And so just last week, we provided $300 million, a small number, $300 million to large cities, but also we focused in on our rural neighborhoods as well. You know, though, um, I think there was an article uh, um, not too long ago about this, but the rural homeless tend to be hidden. And we wanted to make sure that we were seeing them, that everybody was seeing our homeless neighbors there. And so that work continues, that 300 million is is a small amount of the other billions of dollars that we provide to cities and states through vouchers, but also just our homeless assistance funds to make sure that we are capturing families 
and helping to lift them up and to rehouse them. You know, like I said um, at the beginning, because I know we want to get to a little bit more participatory part of the of the day here. You know, the work that we do at HUD is we're expanding access to opportunities, especially for people in communities that have historically lacked access to them. And without justice in housing, we cannot truly carry out our mission to ensure everyone in this country can live with what I call just the basic hope that you are able to help the next generation behind you. Um, dare I say, just like my grandmother wished for my mother and my grandmother wished for me and that I wish for my children and really every other child that I've ever met in a low income, low income family, but really any child anywhere because nothing is given. And that each child should have a safe, loving home where they are able to also garner the confidence so that they can go out and continue this work that we are all in the space of work, making this a better country, a better global community. We're all able to infuse young people with that confidence so they can keep that work going. I see that as a personal charge. I suggest, I, I assume that since you're in this room, you do as well. And as we all get together, I am sure that house by house, community by community, state by state, country by country, we will be that change. We are that change. Um, thank you again for inviting me here to speak with you. And I look forward to our conversation and the questions you will have. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Secretary Todman, for such a, um, it, you know, it's, it's uh, inspiring to hear the uplifting way you talk about your work when, you know, the challenges are really uh, huge and complicated and people lose hope. Um, but as you said, you know, finding a way to give people hope, both the people who are stuck in, uh, in difficult housing situations, but also those of us who want to work for a better Absolutely. day um, it's just so refreshing to hear some someone so um, positive. Always make your bad day a good day. <laughs> no, really, just disassemble your day. Even, even when I have bad days, I sit back and I say, why, why did that feel bad? What, what's going on? But make even your bad days a positive day because you will learn from it. Good, good message for law students. Remember, <laughs> remember that when the when exam time comes around. Um, so I, I'm, I have some questions, but I want you all to be thinking of questions too. We will um, we'll have about, uh, you know, till about 3.15. Um, so uh, I'm gonna maybe give you an opportunity to dig in because a lot of my questions you touched on, on some of the issues, um, but maybe we can dig a little bit, sure. a little bit deeper. Um, first, I wanted to start with a question about homelessness because that is a, the way a lot of people kind of experience the issue of housing is the is the profound lack of yes. it that they see in our neighbors. And uh, we obviously see this uh, in our city here, whether it's, you know, the encampments in Pearson Square or elsewhere, um, particularly in the winter, this is on our minds a lot, seeing our neighbors in that situation. But, you know, it's not just here. Los Angeles mm -hmm. has declared a state of emergency because of homelessness. Um, New York City wants to institutionalized people who are unhoused, who have mental illness. Um, and as you said, you know, yesterday, the lead article in the front page of the Washington Post um, showed it's not just the urban areas, it's housing and urban development, but you know, uh, uh, homelessness in rural areas is really something that we tend not to even, not to even see. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about kind of the scope of the challenge today and, and maybe also how the face of homelessness is different mm -hmm. from what mm -hmm. people might imagine. Mm -hmm. um, because I think maybe that's related to how we can build a more compassionate response Absolutely. to the challenge of, of homelessness, homelessness. And, you know, so maybe you could talk a little bit about, about that, mm -hmm. the scope of the challenge. You know, it's, it's, un and thank you for that. You know, it's, it is unfortunate that you know, on any given night, there's about half a million 
of our, our neighbors who are who are homeless um, and, and then a country as prosperous as ours, you know, we, we can certainly do better. And, and we're trying to, we're trying to. Uh, the secretary um, just over a year ago kicked off a House America initiative. And what that initiative um, was and, and is, was to really create a community of practice amongst, amongst the, the, the um, state leadership, local leadership, to make sure that as they were using HUD funds, treasury funds, again, that partnership across the federal agencies, that, that really folks were challenging and learning from each other about best practices. You know, I've, I've traveled this country, I'm down to three states that I haven't been to over the course of my, the last 10 years. And then a fun fact will be which states those are. <laughs> um, and, and really whenever I go anywhere, folks will say, who's doing it better? You know, what can we learn? You know, there's so many well-meaning leaders who want to make a difference yeah. and are challenged about how to do that because it seems like such a, a dire and you know, glass half empty proposition when you look around and you look at what will it take to really end homelessness. So, what, so the House America Initiative wasn't new money, but it was meant to create some clarity of vision across leadership across the country. And we saw a lot of good work being done. I took a trip out uh, to, to Seattle. Anybody here from the Seattle area? No, I, I took a trip out to Seattle because they were doing an extraordinary job of, well, they didn't begin doing an extraordinary job. They, were, they had a very slow, what we call lease up rate. And this is, you give someone a voucher and they get leased up yeah. in their home and their house. And they were some of the lowest in the country but then they got their act together and uh, it just flipped. I'm not going to say overnight, but it flipped and they were able to, to get some of the best lease of rates in the country. So I went out there to explore like what happened. And it wasn't necessarily, I mean, we, we do need more resources. I don't want this example to, to sort of overlook that. But what they did was they took a more regional approach to how they were coordinating their work. So the city leadership and the county leadership um, in and around the, the Seattle area got together, created a new entity so that they were all aligned and they weren't pointing fingers at each other. They weren't saying it's all those city folk moving out here and the, the county folks were like, you know, really no one was thinking the county folks weren't, weren't carrying their weight, but they all got aligned. And I think that was an extraordinary example of when, when the intentionality that leadership brings to that end. I will say that one of the things that is critical is you do need resources. And we have deployed our housing choice vouchers, uh, sort of Section 8 program, to really make a dent in making sure homeless neighbors are able to, to pay their rent. Um, the administration for each of the last two budgets have requested enormous upticks in the voucher program. We haven't always gotten what we wanted, of course. This is a, a tangle with our friends up in Congress. But we're continuing to message that this is a resource, one plus one is a resource to, to help and to solve this issue. We're also aware that some of our homeless neighbors need additional um, assistance as well. And so working with our partners, again, this federal partnership with HHS, we're making sure that homeless neighbors, who, we, while we are helping solve some of their homeless crisis issues, that there are other parts of the federal family that's helping with some of the service issues as well. One good example of that is the work we're doing with the VA on, on veterans homelessness. Veterans homelessness was reduced by over 50% over the past 10 years, over 50% over the past 10 years because HUD and the Veterans Administration locked arms and were able to get the resources, be intentional, look at the math, look at the data, course correct and able to significantly reduce homelessness amongst veterans. And we're gonna be continuing that work. So, um, you know, it comes in, I wish I could say that this work, we could blink overnight and homelessness will be gone. But it's work that happens day by day and week by week and really person by person. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, so it seems like so many of the human rights uh, challenges that we face here at home and around the world are so deeply interconnected. Yes. You know, that's one of the reasons sometimes that it feels so overwhelming, you know, and I wanted to ask you about like the intersection between climate change mm -hmm. and racism mm -hmm. and housing insecurity, mm -hmm. um, because I didn't really know that much about what HUD was involved. I think about FEMA, I think about, sure. you know, but, you know, from Katrina to Harvey to so many beyond, 
you know, we know, as you mentioned, that people of color are disproportionately affected by um, the effects of these storms and that there have been, you know, severe inequities in the distribution delivery of, of disaster relief. And, and you know, you, you hail from a place that's yes. no stranger to these, um, to these kinds of extreme mm -hmm. weather events and they're getting more and more extreme all the time. Um, you know, how do you see that connection? Yeah. And, and what do you see as HUD's role in like the climate mitigation efforts and, and ways to make these um, disproportionately impacted communities more resilient Absolutely. in the face of impending, you know, climate disasters? You know, I will say, and I know my, my, my team knows this, that this work, our disaster recovery work isn't just professional for me, it's, it's personal. And, and you made the point earlier, you know, as, a, as an island girl, I have seen my family now to three hurricanes. Uh, so um, uh, um, Maria Irma, um, and uh, I'm blanking, Middle Ages, something else. I'm blanking on the, the first one that happened in the 80s, had their roof taken off their home. I, re I remember um, calling my mom just after a hurricane uh, and, and she was expressing, she was just talking to me and just saying, oh my gosh. And she had this terror. And I bring this up because of the terror, but this, this terror in her voice about what would happen next. And then our phone, our phones died. It was traumatizing for me um, up here, much less what was happening directly with, with my family. And so, so you, you multiply that by not just thousands of people, but millions of people, because it's not just hurricanes, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the tornadoes, it's the wildfires. Um, and, and this is traumatizing in general to anyone who has lost their home if you're a multi-millionaire in the, 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 the hills of LA where there's a wildfire. But usually those folks can bounce back quickly, right? There's insurance, there's other income. Where we have centered our work is where that isn't happening and where because of climate change, we know that these disasters will continue to come again and again, sometimes not just with frequency, but just with strength and just odd times of the year. And so we look at this work and we say, we, we, we need to make sure that the black people, the brown people, people of color who are impacted by these storms, who may have had to travel away, are able to not just come back, but have an opportunity to stay and be more resilient in the place that they yeah. will live. And so we're forcing governors and we're forcing mayors to look at the funds that HUD is providing to them. And this is not a little bit of money. This is millions and millions and some, some situations, billions, to make sure that as they're looking at what building back looks like, that they are looking at those neighborhoods and those communities that need to be able to bounce back with the assistance that HUD is providing to them. So this is, this is ongoing work unfortunately, yeah. because disasters continue to come. Um, but it is something where I think it's still available to us. We put out um, a, what's called a request for information. That's bureaucratic talk that we wanna hear your ideas on best ways that we can deploy our funds with that level of intentionality, but also with urgency. So um, I'm sure somewhere in our website, you can see whether or not that, that window of opportunity is open, but we will be doing it again some point in the next year mm -hmm. or so. You know, related to that, I've been thinking about, you know, it's, I think 55 years ago was the um, resurrection city here in, mm. on the mall in DC, uh, which was the, you know, realization of part of Dr. King's yes. uh, plan for the yes. poor people's campaign that he never mm -hmm. lived to, to see uh, happen, but a big, point of that, of Resurrection City, which was a tent, you know, a direct mm -hmm. action campaign that was on the National Mall um, for at least a summer, I think, mm -hmm. uh, was fair housing. And, and you know, thinking about um, why are Black and Brown people often in 
the pet in harm's way mm -hmm. for these climate disasters. Mm -hmm. It relates to this legacy of mm -hmm. redlining and discrimination and racism in US housing policy. Um, so it creates this cycle, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, with lack of the ability to build wealth and to break out of those cycles of poverty. Um, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to dig a little deeper into that program that you mentioned. I was really interested reading about it of making the Fair Housing Act mm. actually, you know, living up to the promise of it That's right. with, you know, really getting at what, what steps are we taking to affirmatively push forward That's right. uh, and overcome these legacies of racism in, in U.S. housing policy. Right. So the, the term of art, get ready to write it down because it, it goes quickly as affirmatively furthering fair housing. Um, and Washington uh, loves an acronym, we right? Do. So AFFH, that's, that's <laughs> our acronym for that one, um, AFFH. And so this is, you know, so the concept here, uh, and I teased it earlier, but the concept here is that, yes, we, we, do, we do need to apply the Fair Housing Act in a way that if someone is being discriminated against, that we are able to say, you know, that's, what, that's unlawful, don't do, yeah. don't do that. But, you know, um, America is, is many things. And one of those things I submit is a place of promise and a place where everybody should have an opportunity to thrive and be what they want to be. But there's so many things that hold back our ability to do that. It could be because you're black. It could be because you're a woman. It could be because you have, uh, you know, your, 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 your religion, your national origin. Mm -hmm. And what AFFH does is say to all of what's called HUD's entitlement communities, more, more HUD geek, um, these are the areas that receive um, some of our, our community development funds. It says to all of those areas, we can do better. We are a country of promise and hope. What is happening in your locality? What is happening in your state that is creating those barriers? Um, whether it be modern day redlining, mm -hmm. right? whether it be not being sensitive to the issues that some of our seniors have in terms of their ability to, to live with dignity as they age. What are the things that are happening and how do you plan to address it? And that's the kicker, is that end part. How do you plan to address it? And so for all these years, we have generally asked, what are the barriers? But we never quite finished the statement, how do you plan to address it? And then held our grantees accountable to what they said. So um, this, this work began in the Obama administration and then the last administration basically quieted the work. And I'm saying that to be kind. Um, what this administration did was um, revived it. We tried to make sure that it was something that could be achievable. We heard a lot of feedback from local, local leaders and state leaders that some of this was hard and the data was hard and getting this work done was hard. And so we took that all in and I submit, I think tried to create a better process so that we can actually have real outcomes. So I encourage you, um, it's available right now on our website. I believe it's in the Federal Register for a formal um, submission of comments this Friday. And you know, I, I, it's a great, maybe it's a great class project, I don't know, that for folks, for folks to think about ways that we can do this yeah. better. Um, and, and, this is, and, and this is work that I feel the secretary feels, the president feels, the vice president feels, will be transformational. That's if really we're exciting. Able to get it done. That's very exciting. Very exciting. Um, well, speaking about that, the, the the role of communities. You know, we're gathering today in partnership with the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs as part of a program called Rethinking Religion and Human Rights. And and one goal of that program is to find ways for communities of faith to engage mm. positively in challenging human rights violations. And I just wonder, do you have any thoughts about mm -hmm. the role for religious leaders and, and communities of faith in partnering with HUD and tackling these challenges? Absolutely. I absolutely do. And I, I have three, three quick examples. One, you know, um, 
HUD actually has an office of um, faith-based um, leadership. And, uh, you know, it is where we partner with faith-based leaders across the country to say, how can HUD really to teach faith-based leaders about HUD's programs and their ability to access it, but really to talk about ways that, that HUD's programs can be interactive with some of the goals that they have um, uh, um, locally. Second, you know, one of the things I found throughout my career is that um, many churches have land and want to develop that land. And HUD has money to develop land <laughs> and also to provide an opportunity for low income um, individuals like you know, said earlier, to, to live in homes. And so there is a whole piece of our body of work of teaching faith-based leaders, if they have access to land, the ability to really um, actualize their housing justice mode and to be able to build, build homes um, and not just have it be a parking lot. Uh, and then the third was a meeting I attended just, just yesterday with the second gentleman. Um, I think many of you may have seen in the, in the media that uh, the president and vice president has charged him with work around all the things we can do to, to take on anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And so we had a conversation again with all the agencies to talk about what that work looks like and ways that we can lift that work up, but really dig deep in terms of each one of our agencies to make sure that we're doing the best we can do in terms of communicating um, um, opportunities and resources and avenues to provide complaints and concerns. Uh, so so faith-based um, opportunities is not a, a, a strange world for, for HUD. We've been doing it. And this is my second tour of HUD. I was there in the late 90s when actually the, the faith-based office was created for just, for just this, to be able to say, look, um, if we're going to look at housing justice as a way for people to have promise and hope in the future. Um, other vessels of promise and hope tends to be where people exercise their faith, whether it be a cathedral, synagogue, elsewhere, a mosque. And imagine the power of having all those worlds swirl together where we are, we are able to just bring out the best in what people can do. That's great, really great. Okay, I'm warning you that I'm about to turn to you uh, for questions, but but first, I just I can't resist asking you, Secretary Todman, you know, about your, you know, decision to go into government, um, and just you know, there are students here in the audience who might be hoping someday to serve in government, including in a you know the form of a presidential appointment like mm -hmm. you, like you are right now. And could you just talk a little bit about what drew you to public service, and you know what it's like to try to make change inside of a you know complex and sometimes uh, immovable <laughs> bureaucracy uh, like the federal government. And, you know, just do you have any advice for students who are thinking about, you know, taking their career in sure. that direction in public service? You know, I'll say, um, uh, don't overthink it. <laughs> um, uh, I am where I am today because I was, I worked hard and I was ready for good luck. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I mentioned that I, I, my first trip to Washington, D.C. was when I was in high school. And that really triggered this, this, this the part of my brain that woke up about, about public service was born. Uh, but I, I worked on the Hill. It was my, my, my first job out of college. Uh, at, a, at a better, I'm doing a, a better time, a better environment when people talk to each other. That thing uh, moved on for my first tour at, at HUD. And let me tell you how I got to HUD, which, I, which is why I'm saying perhaps follow, follow where paths take you. Okay. Uh, I was leaving the Hill. My boss was well tenured. He had been there for 20, 25 years. It was when during the, 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 the Republican takeover, after 30 years of Democratic control, the Republicans took over. Newt Gingrich's office was literally right next to our office. And, uh, you know, it was time to find a new job because as these things churn, um, there's, a, there's a changing of the guard. And so he was retiring. And so we had to find a new job. And so I literally applied to OMB and I applied to HUD. And I'm about 20, how old am I? 
24, 25, applied to OMB, and I applied to HUD. OMB reached out first, offered me a job. I was sitting pretty. I have a job. It's OMB. It's great. Uh, HUD called two weeks later, offered me $17,000 more. And today I'm a hauser. <laughs> for that. Uh, so, so something, something as, uh, something as, as you know, seventeen thousand dollars more for a twenty-four, twenty-five-year-old was 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 kind of a big deal. But you know, I think things are things are things. Everything is meant to happen the way that it did. I was supposed to get that job, which then kicked off this really phenomenal and rich career that I've had of using my leadership skills and the built environment to help people. And I've never looked back from from that decision. And it's uh, it served me well. And I'd like to think that it served many others well as well. So public service is a wonderful place to exercise your brilliance. And if you see any of that brilliance being part of the HUD team, please go to USA Jobs. I'm not kidding. <laughs> go to USA Jobs. Um, that go and apply. You know the the lots of jobs available for for smart, willing people. Great, great. Okay, over to you all. Yes, can you just also just identify yourself when you're asking uh, your sure. question? I guess I had a bit of a two-part question. Um, first, it seems like exclusionary zoning and NIMBYs are a big um, barrier to creating housing and housing generally. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on what the Biden administration has planned to combat that. And then second was, um, in relation to a comment you made about the role of religious and faith leaders, do you think there's any consideration for taxing churches or other religious institutions who own a lot of property, not to pick on the Methodists, but they own a nice piece of land across, like just down there from the Capitol? It seems like that would be taxed I often at a high, to be in that <laughs> high value um, that could go to creating even more affordable housing. Um, I'll, I'll answer the, the second question first, you know, we, you know, I, 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 we look to, to cities and states, particularly when it comes to certain types of tax issues, um, to, to play a leadership role there. So I, I won't, I won't, I, I don't think that there is any plan that I've heard of on the table for us to look at um, the, the tax code as a way to, 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 to push behavior when it comes to, to faith-based institutions. Um, that doesn't mean that there are other leaders here in the city that are thinking about that from a, a, another perspective. As relates to inclusionary, uh, inclusionary uh, zoning, look, you know, we know that another reason why there isn't enough housing supply and why we're struggling with housing affordability is some of the barriers that have been created to building housing writ large, but also affordable housing. That's really all around us. Um, and you know, we have looked at and are looking at ways that the federal government can play a role inside of the zoning space. It's very limited. I mean, we have lots and lots of superpowers, but, uh, but, but zoning at a very local level isn't one of them. So we have to have a carrot and a score stick. And so one of the things that we're looking at now is carrot or stick, maybe both. And so there's going to be more that you're hearing that the administration comes out with as relates to that piece of, of what we're dealing with in terms of building more units, um, but also in the housing supply action plan that I, that I spoke to, there's, there's some nuggets that are in there about ways that other departments in, and, and HUD as well are looking at our existing programs to try to spur good behavior or better behavior to reduce some of those barriers. Inclusionary zoning has, has a, you know, a, you can have a love-hate relationship with inclusionary zoning um, some folks will say, some developers will say that it actually, uh, um, by forcing the private sector to write down some of the value of what they're building, it is, it is not conducive to, to you know, sort of getting, getting the private sector to do the things that you want it to do because you're reducing their value. Um, others say, no, it's actually what we got to do. If, 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 you know, if, if affordable housing, we if affordable housing was something easy to do and people wanted to do it, it'd be done, right? And so we know that that is not the case. And so we need to, to drive that. But things like inclusionary zoning, things like you know, uh, uh, parking um, uh, uh, minimums, uh, other barriers that are created 
are all things that we're looking at as ways of incentivizing or of creating disincentives for localities to do the right thing. So I encourage you to, to look at our housing supply action plan and other news that will come up soon. Thank you. Okay, back here, Chris. Thank you. Uh, Chris White, uh, help oversee the work of the Coalition for Racial Equity and Democratic Economy here at the law school. A uh, quick question, um, as you know, uh, there was a recent bankruptcy by the fifth largest reverse mortgage company uh, in the country, uh, RMF. There are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of seniors with reverse mortgages and their families who are not sure uh, what they need to do to make sure that their interests are protected, you know, not having access to creditors' rights, attorneys, and things of that nature. Uh, I'm, hoping that uh, you can take back to the administration the need to communicate more loudly about the role that the administration is taking in protecting uh, the interests of, of seniors. Um, and you know, even if Ginny May is on top of it, uh, there's still an awful lot of anxiety out there that's making seniors perhaps susceptible to uh, predatory scams. Thank you for that. Um, so some of you um, may know that Ginny May is actually a part of our and so uh, I lived through many, you know, long nights and weekends of watching this all unfold. And it was extraordinarily stressful. And, and we were working with our friend the Treasury and the White House to make sure that um, the seniors uh, participating would be made whole. And we've been able to do that. What I'm hearing, you, and so Jenny is, does have the portfolio and, and is administering it. It's a new bank of work for them, um, I think they're doing an extraordinary job. What I'm hearing you say is that we need to be communicating um, more frequently and maybe with uh, more, more customer-driven words in terms of what's happening. And I will certainly take that back uh, to President Ricardo. We, we certainly don't want seniors to feel that they're in harm's way. Um, and I will take that back as soon as I get back. Thank you for that. Great, great. One over here and then back. Thank you, Madam Secretary. My name is Tom Getman. I'm a former Hill staffer and International Development Director. Um, the Mitch Schneider House right there happened because people in the Methodist building came and lobbied Senator Hatfield when I was his legislative director. And with a stroke of the pen and a big faith-based heart, he built it into an appropriations major measure and made sure it was paid for. Shelter is one thing, getting people in forever or in a transition time is the other, which is really important. And we're having such a difficult time in the neighborhood with resolution 13 out at the stadium and um, housing, getting vouchers to people who are in the streets. What's the administration doing to hasten the voucher process, <clears throat> excuse me, and make sure that the contractors are living up to the law in terms of affordable housing yeah, units? You. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. And thank you for that bit of history as well. Um, so one of the things that is pretty extraordinary is that for many years, there was no such thing as getting new vouchers available in this country, like it didn't exist. Like the, like the last time up until recently was my first tour at HUD where um, it was Andrew Cuomo and Rick Lazio and they wrangled out some deal mm -hmm. and we, we got some new vouchers. The last time we had net new vouchers until this administration. And so we have deployed 100,000, small number, big deal, 100,000 net new vouchers across the country. A portion of those vouchers are dedicated to helping individuals who are homeless. And, um, and that's called our emergency housing voucher program. That's part of the American Rescue Plan um, funding. Um, and so we have been able to increase our capacity inside the department and with housing agencies to get those vouchers up. It had the, the best uptake um, of lease ups. I talked about lease ups earlier than any other new voucher program because we knew um, and keep in mind, this is you know, during a pandemic, we knew that as cities were 
saying to our homeless neighbors, it's time for you to leave the hotels and motels that we, we, you know, we, we placed you in because there was a pandemic. We didn't want to let just, just be the end game. And so we had these emergency housing vouchers for that reason, so that so individuals would be able to be housed permanently. Um, you know, the voucher program comes with many bells and whistles and lots of rules. And so in terms of, of making sure that the, the contractors are doing what they're supposed to do, uh, you know, we do our inspections, uh, we are we are we are very attentive to when voucher holders are saying to us that they're living in places that are have not had the appropriate um, care and, and maintenance. Um, but also, I, there's a, another piece of the voucher program that is as important as the tenant-based vouchers that many of you are familiar with. And these are the when I you know someone receives the vouchers goes into the rental market. One of the things that we do, particularly for individuals who are not able to compete well, don't have good credit, you know, maybe you don't have a job, um, is that we will actually take the voucher and attach them to existing or new rental units. So the subsidy isn't with the person. The subsidy is attached to the, to the building. And that way, if you are uh, someone who perhaps um, you know, doesn't compete well when you're filling out a, a rental application and people that may turn you down, you are able to access housing through this other form. Mm -hmm. And so we are working very closely with housing agencies, mayors, governors, to make sure that everybody is aware of this superpower of being able to not just increase the housing supply, but also to create an operating subsidy stream that allows individuals to, to live in, in affordable housing. So there was more of that on you. That's really creative. Um, yes, way back here. Okay, and then you'll be our last one. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Anami Cuppin. I'm a recent graduate from a master in sustainable development and I'm a voter from Fairfax County. Um, and I wanted to talk about the fact that there seems to be still um, quite a strong economic a focus on quantitative economic growth in the IRA, um, even with increasing transdisciplinary consensus that infinite quantitative economic growth is not compatible with healthy and equitable um, societies and environments. So I would like to know what your opinion is on, um, yeah, on this uh, focus, on the focus of quant quantitative economic growth of the IRA, particularly concerning the fact, particularly given the fact that it's um, given its role in the inequalities that are leading us to have this discussion today in housing? You know, um, there are uh, a lot of brilliant people like yourself uh, who are working in the administration on, on issues um, um, as you described. You know, one of the things that um, we look to do in the administration is to make sure that as we are looking at growth, as we are looking at the work that we do and that we fund, that everything is centered around the space of equity. Everything is centered around the space of making sure that we are deploying our talents and our skills and our funds in a way that is first doing no harm. Um, and so, and this comes to the work of not just HUD, but also in other departments and other places inside of the administration, whether it be the National Economic Council, Domestic Policy Council, all of us driving toward the same place of being able to align our work in the same way. Um, so I think that love to talk to you afterwards more with more specificity about some of the obtuse things I've said there, uh, but, but, um, but um, you know, we are, we are trying to do the best we can. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one last question right there. Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Afini. I'm a community organizer with an organization called Life After Release, a formerly incarcerated Black woman-led organization. Um, currently, we're working on a housing equity ballot initiative for formerly incarcerated Marylanders to continue the work of re-enfranchising them and helping them re-enter 
into our uh, society. 30% um, of Maryland's population is black while 70% of Maryland's po prison population is black. So is there a program that directly supports this community um, within your department? And if not, are you open to plans to support equitable housing for formerly incarcerated people? Um, the last, uh, I'll simply say yes for the question that you ask, and I'll back, I'll back, I'll back into that. You know, the the secretary uh, about not not too long ago asked all of us to do a scan of the programs inside of HUD to see where HUD was creating rules that were creating barriers. Um, to successful reentry and to access to housing, whether that housing be um, where, where the returning citizen is the leaseholder or trying to come back into someone's home that may be public housing or a Section 8 funded home and to take a scan to make sure that we're not the problem. Uh, that scan is almost complete. And there is more that all of you, and you should pay attention to this particularly, more of you will be seeing that HUD is doing to change our rules so that we can make sure that we are, we are not creating those barriers. I will say this, uh, you know, um, and I've been in the industry for a little while, that the, the only criminal acts that preclude someone to have access to federally assisted housing is being on the sex offender list and also the, uh, the, um, um, Production of methamphetamines. That's it. Everything else, there's a gray area, or a not so gray area. So, what we want to make sure is that if that is the law, what is happening inside of the regulatory space, what is happening inside of the actual practitioner space, that's creating additional barriers so folks are able to access homes that need mm -hmm. money. So we're really excited about that work, particularly because we know the impact it has to be able to return back home or wherever you're going to, and to be able to have a secure place to stay so that it helps with your ability to just heal and to move from your experience. Thank you. Wow, this has been just an incredibly rich conversation. <laughs> I really want to thank you for spending so much time with us and for giving us such a, you know, such a, an overview of such a complex and challenging area. I feel like I learned so much. Um, uh, USAjobs.gov. So, uh, okay. <laughs> all right. All right. So thank you all for joining us and please join me in thanking Secretary Todman. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you.